Professor DM from Dungeon Craft proposed July be independent TTRPG month, which I'm all for. Now, this is not a boycott of D&D, but just an opportunity to shed some light on some of those awesome TTRPGs that just don't get as much attention as they should. And so the first one I want to talk about is Cairn. And the timing of this is actually perfect because Cairn just dropped their second edition playtest. So I want to take a look at it to see what new things they're adding, what it's bringing in, and if it's worth your time to learn and play it. But first, let's take a quick look at first edition because Cairn second edition is obviously based off of the first edition, which is a very rules light system. It's only four pages of rules. The entire book, I think, is only about 23 pages long, and the bulk of that is rollable tables and kind of flavor type stuff. So that makes Cairn extremely easy to learn and to teach to your players. When creating a character, you can roll for every aspect, uh, including name, gear, background, etc. If you're playing on Foundry, creating a character only takes about two seconds because you just hit a button and it auto rolls everything and there's your character. But I do think it's more fun to roll for everything yourself and actually go through the process. Even if you do roll for it all yourself, you can still explain the rules and create your characters in about 20 minutes. And that's with people that have never played it before. So the low barrier to entry is one of those beautiful things about this system. Something else I really like about it is the hit protection system and not hit points, but hit protection. This is such a great solution to problems that I've had with the hit point system in the past. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, hit points creates a weird relationship between game balance and immersion. The best example of this I can think of, it was about two years ago, I was running a game and some of my players did some creative stuff, you know, disguise kits and magic to change their appearance. And I can't go into the exact details of everything they did because it probably wouldn't be appropriate for this YouTube video, but they essentially got the big baddie out of his armor and tied to a bed, which is probably enough information for you to figure out how uh, they got there. So the rogue ends up putting his dagger to the baddie's throat, and when he doesn't give the information that the rogue's looking for, he tries to unalive him. With 5e rules, that means it's an auto crit but it didn't even do a quarter of his health. He wasn't the BBEG, but he was kind of a lieutenant and he had quite a bit of HP. So at their level, it only did about 20% of his HP. And I did not like that. That just does not feel good. The person had no armor on, they had no way to protect themselves. And so it's just weird that he wasn't really in danger there. So it just feels really weird in that situation. With hit protection, it represents your ability to avoid damage not how much damage you can take, which makes so much more sense and really increases the level of immersion, I feel. For example, at the end of fights, when everyone patches themselves up in an hour after getting stabbed five times and they're back up to 100% HP, that's just kind of weird. Yes, there's magic, I understand that, but in this system, they didn't actually get stabbed five times. With hit protection, though, it represents their ability to avoid getting stabbed five times, so then after their short rest, when they go back up to 100% HP, it makes sense. And so in essence, hit protection represents kind of your stamina rather than your health, and so it makes sense that you're able to recover that after about an hour or whatever of resting. Now, Karen does have some awesome aspects to it, but there are a few negatives as well. Progression, for example, in this system is not amazing. There's no levels, there are no classes, which I'm a fan of the classless system. It helps keep things very simple and really emphasizes and rewards players based on decision and how they play their characters rather than just being a high level. So progression is based more on gear that you find and they do have a scar system. So whenever you drop to exactly zero HP, uh, you might roll and increase one of your stats by 1d4 or something to that nature. But it's not super consistent, and so your players aren't going to feel like they are progressing. Which is why Karen works really well for a one-shot or three to five session series, but I don't think it works great beyond that. And I'm not saying that you can't do it, you absolutely can. And if your players are the type of players that they just want to tell a really cool story, I think that it can work really well in a long-term campaign. Campaign. But for the majority of players that want to feel like they're progressing and they're leveling up and they're getting stronger over time, Cairn is not really going to provide that 
feeling. The other thing that I've played around with and would change up a bit for the way that I like to run games is the way their rolling system works for ability checks and completing tasks. So in Cairn, if you were to sneak, for example, you would roll a deck save and you need to meet your dexterity score or get lower than it. So for example, if you have a dex of 13, you need to get a 13 or lower and you pass sneaking. Odds are pretty good if your dex is a 13. If you have an 18, it's very good because the only way for you to fail would be to get a 19 or a 20, and a nat 20 will always fail. Similarly, a nat 1 will always succeed. Now, there's two aspects of this that I don't really love. One, it's weird for my D&D players to get used to wanting to roll low because that's the opposite of D&D. In D&D, you want high rolls. It's not that big of a deal, but I would prefer to keep things consistent for my D&D players that want to see high numbers. The other issue is that if you were to try to sneak past a guard dog, for example, that would probably be somewhat challenging. Dogs are pretty perceptive and their sense of smell is pretty good, so that would be pretty hard to sneak past a dog. But in Cairn, that would be the exact same difficulty as sneaking past a passed out drunk guard, which would probably be pretty easy. Now, there is a pretty easy way that you could fix that, and it's just to set the DC to 20 so that you add your ability score to your d20 roll, and if it hits 20 or higher, then you pass. Then, if you want to add a bit of variety to represent harder or easier tasks, you can change the difficulty, maybe add or subtract 3 to the d20 DC. You could change it beyond 3, but if you were dropping it all the way down to a DC 15, I might ask why you're even requiring a roll for something Thing that should be that easy. All right, now to talk about second edition and what new things it brings in. Well, for the rules, there are very few changes. He actually got an editor for this one though, so a lot of it is just clarifications, better layout so that it's easier to read and learn and understand while avoiding some of the confusions of first edition. The main actual change to this one is backgrounds, and I actually really like some of the changes he made to the backgrounds. Instead of just getting a generic background, like you're a noble, now it looks something more like your background is a beast handler and when you pick beast handler or you roll beast handler it affects the gear that you get starting out and there will be some additional rolls. So with the Beast Handler background, for example, you might roll on what creature specialty you have, whether it's birds or felines or canines, for instance. This background change also increases the odds that you could be a spellcaster or at least have the ability to cast spells, especially if you don't roll for your background, if you just select the one that seems most appealing for you. So a player that wants to be able to cast spells, they may pick the half witch background, which will guarantee that they can at least cast spells. So I think that the background change was a great addition to the second edition and fixes some of the problems, especially with character creation and fixes some of the aspects of some of the random gear you get now makes more sense because it's more tied to your background opposed to just getting completely random gear. Uh, you're not going to get full plate with a with a bow. And by the way, I'll drop a link in the description to the sheet where he outlines some of the different changes that he made, as well as where you can go to read the full playtest material. But with Bonds and Omens, I didn't really have a ton of opinion on it. Bonds are all right. It really just helps add a little bit more to your backstory and kind of bring your character to life. So that's kind of cool, but it's not anything game changing. Omens could be cool, but similarly, it's more of a mechanic for the game master, but I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference, and I, I don't know how many wardens are going to use it. It's something that could easily be ignored or forgotten about. Then the last main thing was procedures, but if I'm being completely honest, I haven't read through it fully, and I've never used it, so I don't really have a lot of opinions on it. it. It could be cool. You can read about it yourself. Overall, though, I think second edition definitely improved on Cairn. It didn't really change the rules much, but with the extra clarification, making it a little easier to learn and pick up. I just think that that's a good thing. And if you have friends or people that want to play a TTRPG, but you don't want to necessarily put the work it would take into setting up a fifth edition campaign or you want to ease them into it, I think Cairn is an awesome option. I think anything five sessions or less, uh, this is where this system really thrives.